was a time of a preacher when a story begun. She left him for someone She left behind And I cried Hey, good evening, everybody. And good evening. Here we are in uh, what is a remarkable new office that you were recorded your sermon in on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I did right there in front of that bookshelf. Nice bookshelf. Thanks. (laughs) Yeah. I got it. Yeah, I got it from someone I know. <laughs> Good, because I needed it out of my house. <laughs> what have you been up to? What well, you, you know, we had this <clears throat> this long move. I'll lean into the mic for everyone. Um, yeah, if, if you if you guys can hear us and you can hear us well, give us a thumbs up. Let us know. Uh, we're doing something a little bit different. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Letting everybody uh, gather. We've just been moving. Uh, thankfully. We uh, closed on the house. That's on the sale. Fantastic. Which is always a good thing. And we are apartment dwellers. Oh. Uh, I remember that. Marty? Uh, We are apartment dwellers until, who knows, when the house is finished Mm. being built. But they're making great progress. And... uh, Cindy drove by today, took pictures, and sent them out to the family. He said, "Here's it's where a we fun are." Process. So it's a fun process, and and uh, uh, that sort of thing. But uh, are you are you in the screenshot over there? I am. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Good day. Uh, so this is what I've been doing. My back is very sore. Uh, appreciate you giving me some relief for Sunday. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, and uh, good job on Sunday. Thank Are you. we talking about your sermon first? Yeah, we're we're going to talk about my sermon just briefly. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring everybody up to speed in case they decide to skip it. <laughs> if, they oh, did, if they didn't see it, uh, hey, it, good to see you, uh, Marco. Marco. Marco, there he is. That's right. Glad to have you, Lewis. Hope you're doing well. A simple faith. Hello. Oh, that was me. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. us. That's us. That's right. <laughs> um. So yeah. Uh. So talking about the this idea of freedom, mm-hmm. right? So you, you had finished your um, your sermon series on the life of Joseph, and I was like, you know, I, I feel like the natural progression then is to what happens immediately after this. You you have this Exodus story, and so this this thought, this idea of you know this the Exodus is this story, yes, uh, uh, that happens you know with Joseph and and Jacob's descendants, his brothers' descendants in the land of Egypt. Um, we, we all are familiar enough with the story to understand what happens then and there, but the Exodus story is also this ongoing phenomenon that happens throughout Scripture, mm-hmm. and it happens throughout our life uh, that we ha- often see. And, uh, you know, in <clears throat> so I, I just want to kick this off by simply saying um, the reason I, I, I wanted to have that particular conversation about this Exodus and using our story, using our Exodus story, um, in listening to the stories of other people um, is because we are communal. We are a community uh, of people. We are meant for relationships. And we've lost the ability to listen. Uh, we, we've forgotten the value of being a good listener, uh, of seeing people as human beings, as equals, as people with a story, with a history. Um, we've lost that ability uh, to, to just enjoy dialogue with one another. And to hear the heart of the other person, um, so what? What a great thing to be thinking about. You know, this idea of Exodus story. How, how is God renewing, liberating, freeing me from you know whatever it is in my life, and using that story to help me grow? And and then how can how in turn can I use this freedom that I have in Christ in my relationship with God to be an asset to other people um <clears throat> so you know just off the top you know if if you missed the sermon if this is it in a nutshell god is on the side of the oppressed and the marginalized and those beaten down my life 
Um, and there's this active continual exodus happening in and around us all the time. And we can see it happening if we choose to be a part of it. And God is, he's rescuing, he's renewing, he's redeeming, he's recharging, he's rebuilding, he's reconstructing. Um, yeah. It's just absolutely phenomenal when we start to think about, you know, this this liberating freedom that we have and how God is doing that in and through throughout our life. I was thinking about I was thinking about some of those very thoughts. We got together earlier this week and kind of gave ourselves a format for for tonight. And um, I was thinking about, in light of everything you said Sunday, in light of Joseph, uh, about just if you were to distill some of the basics. Uh, of Jesus's teachings, his life, what he what he was telling people, mm-hmm. what he was uh, <clears throat> living out in front of people, uh, you you begin at a place where he was in solidarity with the weak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, if you, if you start with the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, mm-hmm. blessed. I think your neighbors got somebody breaking into their car. It's, it's possible. It's not me. <laughs> They're breaking into your truck. Well, I uh, guess it's not. I me. don't think it's me. It wouldn't me. It's your neighbor. <laughs> uh, uh, you start with the Beatitudes, and it's about meekness, weakness, uh, the poor, which sends a, a very strong signal about what Jesus is saying <clears throat> early on. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. His first sermon back at, at Nazareth, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to yeah. the poor. Yeah. And then at the conclusion of his ministry, uh, two days before his crucifixion, uh, uh, you know, he tells the parable of the least of these. And, and so there is this liberation, and there's a whole brand of thinking about liberation theology that you and I in our traditions wouldn't have gotten close to, but but particularly in Catholic theology, uh, about the gospel setting people free, mm-hmm. not just spiritually, but in all facets of life, about getting to, to true liberation as a complete person. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's not always as explored probably as it, as it should be in our more Protestant churches, where spirituality is more private. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. it's, it's more... You know, this is between you and God. When your personal relationship, personal, your personal Jesus. relationship with Jesus, and and <clears throat> Jesus, the Jesus theology, as you see in the New Testament, is communal. Yeah, it's communal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying about uh, being available to people, talking to people, mm-hmm. uh, we we only get free together. Yeah, uh, there's the old gospel song, you know. None of us are free, uh, because if because if one of us is chained, none of us are free. Uh, oh, we're gonna pull out Brene yeah. Brown, or, so, just, or just a pen, or either book. No, it's uh, I was reading. It's ironic. Oh, let's I get, was let's reading. Let's get a screenshot of this book. Uh, let's see here. Let's go solo on this camera. So th- this is a uh, braving the wilderness. And I, the, the subtitle is incredibly long. The Quest for True Belonging and the tr- Courage to Stand Alone. And this is by Brene Brown. And it's ironic that I was reading this chapter today. And it was absolutely brilliant. Because she's talking about how over the course of the years, uh, just we as an American society have really segregated ourselves even further. Uh, and, and, you know, she gets into the politics of it. and uh, But she really dives into this idea that um, we, we are so meant for community and she gets into the idea of loneliness mm-hmm. and, uh, I'll, I'll have to look it up real quick, but, um, and that's well, while you're doing that, I'll, <clears throat> so that you can give your full attention to looking up, let me just make a comment about Brene Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brene sort of burst onto the scene a few years ago with a Ted talk of all things. And she has been a therapist and a counselor, experienced a lot of turmoil in our own life she talks a lot about shame Mm -hmm. and overcoming shame she talks a lot about community uh she is and if if you've never read her i'm telling you and and if you can stop watching right now you have full permission if you would just stop go if 
to your local bookstore or independent bookstore primarily, but if you have to go to Amazon, go to Amazon and just search Brene Brown and uh, what's that What's that main book, the one about Shane? The title has just oh, escaped me. I don't know. I might have it up on my bookshelf. I, I, I wish... I wish I'm ashamed I don't know that. I wish my friend David Beavers was watching right now because David would, has memorized that book. Uh, there, called, that's it. Perfection. The, that's the, the Gifts that, of Imperfection. The Gifts of Im, Imperfection. So uh, that one right that there. One, yeah. This one right here. So I'm going to show that one to you. This is absolutely required <coughs> reading. and uh, Check in with us next week yeah, on that. We, there's, going to, there's going to be a book report on this book right here. Absolutely fantastic. So, but yeah, so, so she... Oh, I just lost the. There it is. Um. She she quotes this neuroscientist, or neuroscience researcher, and he defines loneliness. So he gets, you know, the, the the reason we're all talking about this, or the reason we're talking about this, is this idea of community, and uh, you know, freedom and liberation, and we've forgotten this idea of how to operate within our story in helping other people, serving one another out of love, as Paul says in Galatians. Um, and using that freedom Christ has given us um, to, to really the benefit other people. It's not just for ourselves, but uh, anyway, she dives into this idea of loneliness and separation. And the reason we feel this loneliness is because we live in fear of, of social interaction, of being vulnerable. That's, that's the biggest thing she gets to is that we've forgotten how to be vulnerable with other people, sharing the things that have really moved us in life. The, the process, the, the exodus stories that we've gone through, mm-hmm. you know, and that's really what I was pinpointing in my talk Sunday um, <clears throat> was that w- we all come from such different, different backgrounds mm-hmm. and we are who we are because of where we've come from, you know, f- our families, where our family came from. We, we had this conversation yesterday um, with both our paternal uh, grandparents coming from Ireland and in, in Scotland and, you know, different parts of England, Europe. Um, but we've, we've further isolated ourselves and put ourselves into our own little tribes, into our own uh, uh, echo chambers, mm-hmm. to where we're, we're afraid of being vulnerable, we're afraid of having conversations with other people out of fear of what might be exposed. But in that exposure, in that liberating moment, uh, of what God has done in our life, of, of sharing that, of which we've gone through and what God has brought us out of. Yeah. That's that's the critical piece that's missing in a lot of yeah. communities and relationships. Uh, and I'll take it take it back to to the twelve step <coughs> uh, movement, the recovery movement. Mm-hmm. Where does it begin? It begins by the admission that my life has become unmanageable and I must surrender to a higher power. So that's where it begins, but it doesn't move there. The 12 step movement is a community movement because then you begin to confess your sins one to another in a group of people. Mm, yeah. And I've met with people over the years that, you know, whether they're dealing with alcoholism or they're dealing with drugs or they're dealing with some, some sort of, 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 of addiction. And they'll say, you know, I'm just, I just, I just can't, I just can't get in a room and, and, Tell people what I've done. And that's shame. Mm-hmm. But once yeah. the shame is broken, oh man, they get free. Yeah. The liberation begins because you you realize in that circle of people, these people are just like me. Mm-hmm. And there's even the encouragement, oh hell, he's worse than me. But <laughs> but it's but true. he's but he's but he's he's improving. He mm-hmm. was maybe worse than me, but now he or she is 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 recovering. They're they're, right. they're set free. The burdens off their shoulder. They're beginning to make amends. They're beginning to make reconciliation. And it gives in that vulnerability. It gives people uh, the opportunity to get honest and then to get free. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just you know for me thinking about you know the necessity that. That there, that there is that we're missing within the church. You know, th- speaking of what you're talking about, like, I, th- I feel like, and I felt like for a while, one of the biggest things the church often misses is that they try to manufacture those type of group gatherings. Yeah. So, so rather than letting it be organic and, 
you know, I want to be there or I, I feel like this is my last step uh, of, of take, you know, that I need to take it in order to better myself. They go there by themselves on their own accord without feeling the guilt and shame of feeling like they're pushed in that direction. Like yeah. you have to, because this is a church function. Right. So rather than, you know, the church manufacturing this environment, it's, it's very much organic and allows for that freedom and, and, and space yeah, to be vulnerable. Victoria Hunt's on here commenting <clears throat> now. She talks about the fear of rejection and the fear of judgment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's one thing about like recovery movies. And I've said for years, and if you, if you, <clears throat> if you've been at a simple faith, you know, this, if you've read my stuff, you know, this and did a whole series of sermons years ago about the 12 values, not the 12 steps but the 12 values of recovery movements and how their communities work. And so this is this has been a big piece, and, I, and I've said for years that church, I got this from Brendan Manning, hmm. churches should look more like 12-step meetings than what we have created. Yeah. In this sense of here I am, uh, and it begins with here I am and I'm a sinner, or here I am and here, here are my faults, and I'm not afraid to hide those <clears throat> from you how can we get better together? Mm -hmm. How can we get, we get well together? And uh, Victoria, you're right. If you can only have that kind of community, if 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 rejection and judgment and those type things are are set aside, and you can only set aside judgment and and uh, rejection if that community of people understands that, as Dr. King said that we are we from the same fabric of destiny. We're in this together. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that probably needs to be said, you know, tonight as much as any time in, in our lifetimes in this country. Uh, your team may have won. Your team may, may have lost. We are in this together. And, and we have to, <clears throat> to, to figure out a way not to come to a mushy middle we have to find a way uh, to stop dehumanizing people, right? And, and really listening, you know, because and listening, mm -hmm. um, you know, because we're not, you know, we we said this at least four or five times yesterday. We're not gonna, you know, no, meddle, we're not, we're not gonna meddle into all that. But just turn on your t if you have, <coughs> to have that, turn on your television. You know what's going on. But it goes back to why I started off by saying like we've lost the ability to listen, yeah. um, you know, because I can understand different perspectives and why people chose this and why people chose that. And when you really get to the heart of it, you, it's, it's not even so much a question of morality, which has come into play a couple different times or whether or not you're a true believer. Well, and sometimes it, it, it is, sometimes <coughs> it is morality, it, it, but, yeah. but it, it's not necessarily, we still, what you said at the very beginning we still have to understand, and we don't, mm -hmm. people's experiences. That's that's, about, that's the thing about, I was getting to. Yeah, about where 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 they have been. So, like, I, I would I would if I knew your story, if I knew more about your grandparents, your parents, your your siblings, and mm -hmm. you know the, the life you've lived up to this point would help me very much understand A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D, yeah. and why you, you yeah. Know, because, anyway. Uh, I've said this in, in, in retreat settings and, and uh, to individual in marriage counseling, you can always overcome, always overcome <clears throat> personality differences because mm -hmm. it's just personality. What's hard to overcome is when we have divergent values. Yeah, and that's something that Brene Brown. That Brene Brown yep. talks about that. Yep. And when you have divergent <clears throat> values, then you have you have to have to come to Jesus, mm -hmm. where you determine, okay, where where is the common ground? Right. And when you find the common ground, it becomes sort of a sacred space. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, but it ta that takes work, right? That takes communal work. That takes listening. It takes everything you're talking about. Because again, and what I appreciate about what you said Sunday, and what has rang in my head since the end of that gospel song, uh, none of us are free. If one of us is chained, none of us are free. It, absolutely, absolutely. We we get better together. 
Yeah. And, and the last thing I, I put on this as kind of my, uh, you know, closing thought on, on what I was trying to convey Sunday is just simply this. If we're on the side of the oppressed and the marginalized and those beaten down, then we're on the side of God. That's exactly right. So if, if, yeah. if we feel like we're on opposing sides, then, then there's something we're actively choosing to go against the grain in an aspect of our life. Right. Uh, and, and that's where we have to get down to the nitty gritty and right. figure out and, and what in, am I missing <clears throat> in liberation theology. And I just saw, Hey, Kurt Ackerman from, uh, who's down in El I saw Salvador. Jeff, I saw Jeff, Jeff Allen. Give him a thumbs up. Uh, and Nancy. And, 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 and I think, I think, uh, Kurt would, has heard this phrase, uh, about God's prefer, preferential treatment of the poor, meaning that, that if you want to know where God is at, <clears throat> find where suffering people are. Oh man. And that's where God is at. Yep. That's yeah, where God is and at. Kurt, you know, our prayers are with you guys and we know that uh, we know that Honduras and Nicaragua they're all getting lots of rain right now, so continue prayers for you guys. Yeah, yeah Kurt, if you if you would mind if you're still watching there, if you could uh, <clears throat> just give us an update on how you're doing, that'd be fantastic down there with Hurricane what I, I can't remember. Etta. Etta, Etta. 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 Yeah. ETA, ETA, uh, for sure. Um, so uh, just just real quick, uh, we're gonna do tonight's uh, Q and A actually in different segments. So we have segment two coming up. Uh, we have a video that we're gonna show you guys, um, and then at the end, as as we're having these conversations and discussions, you know, feel feel free to uh, ask questions throughout. We're gonna save the the question aspect for the end, uh, but we're gonna talk about Alzheimer's next. And Ronnie, you're going to be leading that, and I have a you video. You got the video? I do. Uh, this is just a timely <clears> issue <throat> for me, so we've kind of divided up our Q&A tonight in, in 10 to 15 minute segments. So don't run away, those of you that are watching. This is uh, actually from the Alzheimer's Association, and uh, I'll get to why we're talking about this specifically in just a minute. Roll the tape! <laughs> Every four seconds, someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common cause of dementia, affecting over 40 million people worldwide. And yet, finding a cure is something that still eludes researchers today. Dr. Alois Alzheimer, a German psychiatrist, first described the symptoms in 1901, when he noticed that a particular hospital patient had some peculiar problems, including difficulty sleeping, disturbed memory, drastic mood changes, and increasing confusion. When the patient passed away, Alzheimer was able to do an autopsy and test his idea that perhaps her symptoms were caused by irregularities in the brain's structure. What he found beneath the microscope were visible differences in brain tissue in the form of misfolded proteins called plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Those plaques and tangles work together to break down the brain's structure. Plaques arise when another protein in the fatty membrane surrounding nerve cells gets sliced up by a particular enzyme, resulting in beta amyloid proteins, which are sticky and have a tendency to clump together. That clumping is what forms the things we know as plaques. These clumps block signaling and therefore communication between cells, and also seem to trigger immune reactions that cause the destruction of disabled nerve cells. In Alzheimer's disease, neurofibrillary tangles are built from a protein known as tau. The brain's nerve cells contain a network of tubes that act like a highway for food molecules, among other things. Usually, the tau protein ensures that these tubes are straight, allowing molecules to pass through freely. But in Alzheimer's disease, the protein collapses into twisted strands or tangles, making the tubes disintegrate, obstructing nutrients from reaching the nerve cell and leading to cell death. The destructive pairing of plaques and tangles starts in a region called the hippocampus, which is responsible for forming memories. That's why short-term memory loss is usually the first symptom of Alzheimer's. The proteins then progressively invade other parts of the brain, creating unique changes that signal various stages of the disease. At the front of the brain, the proteins destroy the ability to process logical thoughts. Next, they shift to the region that controls emotions, resulting in erratic mood changes. At the top of the brain, they cause paranoia and hallucinations. And once they reach the brain's rear, 
the plaques and tangles work together to erase the mind's deepest memories. Eventually, the control centers governing heart rate and breathing are overpowered as well, resulting in death. The immensely destructive nature of this disease has inspired many researchers to look for a cure, but currently, they're focused on slowing its progression. One temporary treatment helps reduce the breakdown of acetylcholine, an important chemical messenger in the brain, which is decreased in Alzheimer's patients due to the death of the nerve cells that make it. Another possible solution is a vaccine that trains the body's immune system to attack beta amyloid plaques before they can form clumps. But we still need to find an actual cure. Alzheimer's disease was discovered more than a century ago, and yet still it is not well understood. Perhaps one day we'll grasp the exact mechanisms at work behind this threat, and a solution will be unearthed. Okay, we're back. I'm just watching the video, so I'm on a little bit of a delay <clears throat> in the control center here. So, obviously, personal reasons that I bring up. Well, well personal reasons and timely reasons. Uh, November isn't just election month in the United States. November is, uh, every month seems to have a cause. Mm -hmm. You know, Black History Month. Breast Cancer Awareness Month. No Shave November. No Shave November is one. It's about prostate health for men. Yeah, I'm not going to shave my legs. That's right. Don't shave your legs. Well, November is also uh, <coughs> the month for emphasis on Alzheimer's and dementia disease. Mm -hmm. And we're here early in the month, and you may see some things online and on television about Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, and, and this awful disease. Just an awful disease. And uh, my father-in-law, who, who passed away a couple weeks ago, uh, suffered from Alzheimer's dementia. He was diagnosed, I think, early to mid, in his early to mid-70s. I can remember very, very distinctly, he, we had his 70th birthday party here in like 2000. 2007, 2006, something like that. He had, he had turned mm -hmm. 70. He was still very independent. You know, had had the occasional, uh, where did I put my keys? But gosh, I have that now. Right, right, uh, right. Like the common joke of... Right, right. And so by, but by 75, <clears throat> certainly by 75, it was more than just uh, forgetting things. I, I, won't t I won't get into the, the funny story. But it ended up being a very funny story uh, about he had forgotten where Cindy's mom was going to be at a Christmas party, hmm. and uh, she had gone to a, to a, to a work Christmas party, and it turned into this just fiasco. That maybe I'll tell the story someday, but I won't tell it right now. And we all the family sort of laughed and this sort of thing. But then afterwards, a couple of days afterwards, Cindy and I were talking, and it was like that wasn't right to forget that. Hmm. And then the chaos that ensued. Right. So he died at almost 85. I want to say that's right. 86. So he, he, he essentially lived with Alzheimer's for 10 years. And he had pro pro progressed in the disease to stage 5. So he had he had, had the short-term memory loss. Uh, he had uh, the... The, the <coughs> wicked mood changes, sleep mm -hmm. disorders, uh, some hallucinations, and uh, and ultimately uh, all of his memory, even long you know long term memories were fading. Even though he could he could reach into that and, and grab a few of those memories at the end, uh, and, and ultimately died of other physical reasons, but weakened by by dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't think he minds me telling because he told me our own Nick Turner has uh, stage two dementia, non-progressive, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, which is a gift. Thank thank God for right, that. Right, right, right. Uh, but Nick has had has had a stroke in the past. Yeah, and so it's stroke induced, and remarkably, you know, he's fifty nine, sixty years old. And 
thankfully he's on the same drug my father-in-law was on for Alzheimer's and it, it it'll take it a while to become effective but it will become effective uh, this disease affects six million Americans it is the only disease in the United States that is in the top ten causes of premature death that we don't have a cure for hmm. we know what to do about uh, heart disease we know what to do to a large extent about cancer. Not every cancer is curable. Right. But so many more are today compared to a decade, 20 years ago. Uh, we know what to do to prevent, you know, deaths in car accidents. I mean, right, there, right. there are preventative measures. <clears throat> Alzheimer's is, is, is tough because there's a genetic quality to it uh, that you may carry the gene. It doesn't mean it's going to get activated because everybody carries cancer cells in the body, but it doesn't mean you're going to get cancer. Yeah. Uh, so until science can figure out a cure, uh, one of the, one of the things, uh, Peggy Fogarty says, lung, November is also lung cancer month. And Peggy, my friend Peggy there is commenting, she's lived with lung cancer for, uh, eight years. Hmm. And, you know, a decade ago, uh, 15 years ago, they were telling you three months. Yeah. But advances there have, yeah, it's, have it's really given wild. incredible quality mm -hmm. of life uh, going forward. Uh, but until there's a cure, there, Alzheimer's is taxing, and I've seen it firsthand now, taxing on families and caregivers in a way that a lot of diseases are not. Every right. family is going to be a caregiver when someone is sick. Uh, when they're in hospice, when they're near the end. Alzheimer's is such that you can live 15, 20 years if it's slow and have to have care. Mm. You can't be left alone. Right. Uh, and... So spouses of those who have the disease, the children, the grandchildren, siblings, uh, they have to make gut-wrenching decisions about how do we care for the one that we love. Mm -hmm. And what, what kind of toll, you know, because we had this conversation yesterday, like uh, Aaron's grandfather mm -hmm. had, uh, I believe he had dementia. Um, I don't think he had Alzheimer's, but I could be wrong. But I mean, it was taxing on her family. After her grandmother passed away, she was the caregiver. Um, and, but then her mother and then, then, uh, her aunts had to begin the process of taking care of him. I mean, 24 hour watch, 24 hours. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know him prior to him, his diagnosis, but what kind of toll does that take on a person mm -hmm. to have to witness that the, the slipping and the slow progression or in some cases, you know, really, really progressive Year, years ago. And, and I think it was Joe Klein wrote a column for Time Magazine called The Long Goodbye. Hmm. And he summed it up best. Both his parents had Alzheimer's. Not just one. And he talks specifically about that, having to make those decisions. I know in my own, and she's probably going to watch this later. Hey, Ruth. Uh, my mother-in-law, Ruth Cooper, uh, <clears throat> you know, was the caregiver. Yeah. And she has diabetes. She's over 80. It's hard. It's hard physically. It's mm -hmm. hard emotionally. Cindy's brother moved back to Georgia and lived in the home for the last year. Uh, he and his wife provided invaluable help. Uh, Cindy, as a school teacher, was able to be available in summers, holidays. Cindy's sister is a nurse. So they have it. Be they had it better than most in the in the sense that people could be readily available. Yeah, and and do the work. But even in the last six months, the, really the last year, Ruth kept Ruth kept uh, George at home probably longer than he should have. But then COVID hit. Yeah, and you can't get him placed somewhere. And once he's placed somewhere, we couldn't see him. So it was just this rolling disaster. Jeff Allen's recommending a book. Jeff, we only saw the, the first word of that book. Maybe that's so intentional. Creating, maybe creating what? Dot, dot, dot. So so he'll he'll come back around. <laughs> creating moments, of, moments joy. of joy. Thank you. And I know Jeff has dear friends uh, that 
the, the their female friend, the wife in that couple, has had dementia for a long time, it's, and yeah. the husband has kept her at home at great expense, not financially, at great physical expense. Right. Uh, because he, he won't have any, he will care for her until he can't. Mm. And uh, with this many people being affected, and with an aging baby boomer population that lives longer, and with Alzheimer's and dementia for whatever reason in, in our country, we really, uh, very similar to autism in some ways, we have more cases of it per capita than a lot of places. Something about our lifestyle maybe is a trigger for it. Uh, the church has to be, uh, as much as it can, responsive to that. Providing a meal, uh, being able to, to, to uh, when possible, I'll come to the house while, and, and sit with her or him while you go to the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Not just to get groceries, but just to get a break. Right. Uh, those type of things really matter. And if the person is still functional and can get out and, and and you can have them in your home, you know, under blue skies if COVID's not an issue, inviting them to a dinner and being patient with that 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 person. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and I've got a column coming out this, this weekend about my father-in-law. And I wrote about him 10 years ago when he was first <clears throat> diagnosed. He was diagnosed... And the family was grappling with the diagnosis about the same time that Pat Summit, the legendary coach yeah. Oh, yeah. of of the Tennessee, Tennessee uh, girls oh. basketball team, women's basketball team, just a legendary woman, and she got Alzheimer's in her late fifties. Mm. And, and hers was really aggressive. severe, aggressive. She didn't live ten years, and uh, it was really tough, you know, because it was a public. She mm. was a public figure. And, uh, you know, in, in, in this age and time of genetic testing, you know, those type of things, uh, I know that I carry the Alzheimer's gene. I know that at 50 years age. Mm-hmm. I knew it at 40. Doesn't mean I'm going to get Alzheimer's. But I carry. I carry the main gene that's an indicator that you could get Alzheimer's. Now, do I think about that? No. You know, uh, do I think about that for my son Braden? I think about that sometimes. Yeah. You know, that, that that Cindy's family has a history of it, and I'm a genetic carrier of it. So I do, I do think uh, uh, about that. Nancy, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's just Nancy. That's precious that you. Which camera are we on? <laughs> I'll put it on you. Sir. Okay, that's just Nancy. It's just precious that you would share that. We will pray for you, uh, as 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 Bob is struggling with a diagnosis. It's hard, and uh, I would say to you right now, to you, Nancy Gross, if you need anything, you know that that you have friends and loved ones in this congregation that will do anything they can. Can do everything because it's such a personal and private thing. I know, but know that you're supported and loved and uh, I, I appreciate your your vulnerable there what we're talking about the very thing <clears throat> yeah. we started about vulnerability by showing yourself you're vulnerable yep. and set aside <clears throat> any shame or embarrassment about that and then people can rally to you and I believe and I believe they will and and, and help you so uh, yeah it's a it's a tough disease it it, it um we just need to be aware of it. Mm-hmm. And this sort of goes back to what you were saying, too. We can be very so self-centered about our own stuff. <laughs> you know? Yep. And it's easy. Life's hard. Oh, right, right. We, we, <laughs> I mean, it's hard. We are, you know, and that's that's the thing is we are, and, and it's really not, I mean, it's kind of a, a hybrid monster of our doing. We are a consumeristic society. We, we're a fast food society where we want things now we want things to happen now i mean just sitting in line at a drive through and the person in front of you is taking forever you, you just don't know what, patient. yeah we don't know what they're going through when i would say let me say yeah. that's a great segue i'll say this and i think we have to move to another yeah video. we do i'll say this and <clears throat> this is this is from my my physician two things will help you avoid 
dementia and Alzheimer's more than anything, and this is in the books. This is in the in the studies. And uh, Dr. Ed Varnador, he tells me this all the time. Every every time I have a, a checkup, avoid fast food, United States fast food, and take a walk every day. Hmm. Those two things will help you avoid. Uh, early onset dementia or Alzheimer's better than anything. Wow. Crazy, isn't it? Avoid American fast food, which is hard. <laughs> and take a walk every day. Yeah. Take a walk every day. No, that's not a full <clears throat> pledge guarantee, but that's something you can practically do. Do you want to uh, give the setup for what we're about to show them with Mr. I would uh, love to. Yeah, so we titled this, uh, what was it? Um, I forgot. Uh, the, forgetful, the, for, for freedom, freedom, forgetfulness, forgetfulness fragility, fragility, and, and Kevin. Kevin, Kevin Simonson, our dear friend who's out west now, living the cowboy <coughs> dream. Him and Denise, close to their boys, which uh, uh, I'm so excited for them for that. Uh, Kevin's just playfully sent me a video the other day, and I told him I loved it so much I was going to save it for for later use. And then I got another video said, well, "If you're going to do that, I prefer this one," because I think Denise and <coughs> Cindy uh, uh, were possibly possibly making fun of his hair in that first video. <laughs> But it, it's a video to honor Jerry Jeff Walker. And if you don't know who Jerry Jeff Walker is, you're forgiven for that. He was a great songwriter. Well, I appreciate your forgiveness. He was a great songwriter who settled in Austin, Texas, part of this whole outlaw country music thing back when Willie Nelson and and uh, Waylon Jennings and Chris Christopherson <clears throat> were making just fantastic music together. And he was writing a lot of their songs. He gets a shout out in the song by, by Will, Willie and Waylon. Let's go back to Luke and Bach, Texas. Uh, those Jerry Jeff Train songs is one that's mentioned in that song. Well, the song that Walker is most famous for is Mr. Bojangles. Hmm. Mr. Bojangles, dang it. And Kevin is doing a rendition of that for us tonight. So, Mr. Kevin Simonson, Jerry Jeff Walker's Mr. Bojangles. Freedom. Freedom. Forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. Fragility. Fragility. And Kevin. And Kevin.
great. I love it. I love it. Great job, Kevin. I hope you see this later. And, and <clears throat> not just a not just a great job vocally. Hearing that Martin guitar that we haven't heard in a long time ring out in your new house just. And I love I love the background. Oh, Look, I know beautiful. it. Beautiful. They're in Sisters, Oregon. We just so, we all need to take a trip out there sometime. Yeah, we may just show up at their door. Everybody just we'll yeah. get their address and we'll figure out what yeah, time we'll, to go. We we'll just we we'll just show up at their door when it's not fire season. Right. I think the smoke got close to them. This or year. snow over the, yeah. the mountaintops going that's, through the Rockies. That's right. So they have a son that lives in Portland uh, and a son that lives in northern Colorado. Mm. So they're between the two boys. And uh, uh, What a beautiful drive that beautiful, is. Beautiful, beautiful in lo- both locations. One son is doing social work and one is working for the Justice Department. Mm. Just fan- just They've raised that's incredible great. young men. And then Kate, Kevin's <clears> mom is still here. She's in assisted living uh, uh, down on the south side in South Walton. Uh, visitation has been restricted, so we're not able to see her a lot. Right. But Kevin also has a, a brother that still lives here in North Florida, too. So hmm. so she's well cared for. And uh, Her name is Kate. Those of you who may not know her, she's just a doll. Uh, if, you lo- if you like Kevin, you'll love Kate. <laughs> just great, great folks. So... Uh, Fragility. Yeah, fragility. So, I mean, we, we have to, three Fs. We had to go and with Kevin. the third. And Kevin. And Kevin. He was the oddball. Um, so, yeah, fragility. Uh, you're just recapping, thinking about the year 2020. Oh, let's not do that. <laughs> but just thinking about this year and, and what it's taught us. I mean, there, there's, there's, so, there's so much... There's so many layers to it. You know, when you think about what this year, ha- I mean, has really done. Yeah. Uh, what, what it's been, what people have experienced. Um, <clears throat> you know, going back to what I mentioned earlier, um, it's taught us multiple things. Um, that there are a lot of things in ourselves, in our country, in our communities, and in the world that need need work there's there are elements about this year and things that have happened that and I'm, this is not an exaggeration okay I'll determine that <laughs> <laughs> there are things that have happened in this year that I will process for the rest of my life mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and I I said this way back in March and, and I got some some comments from some folks that were like oh I think that's an overreaction but I said in March that the next months would define a generation of Americans I said that in our last uh, gathering public gathering before we all went into quarantine mm-hmm. and I had a few people say oh you sound real worried about it like uh, but you know, it's, you know, wash your hands. I'm like, no, 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 no. It, it, I'm not worried about my physical body. I'm just saying that this thing's gonna leave a mark. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because just look at history. These type of things, when they come around, they leave a mark on the people that go through them. Mm-hmm. And that's, and it's still leaving a mark. <clears throat> uh, and, and, you know, there's a quarter of a million Americans that have died right. directly or related to yeah. COVID. And we're going in, and I'm not being a doomsdayer at all, but we're going into winter. And it's mm-hmm. going to be a hard winter. Yeah. It's just going to be a hard winter. And uh, we'll do better here because we have milder weather and we can get outside. <clears throat> uh, we're not going to see any of our Canadian snowbird friends. They can't cross the border. Hmm. I've already heard from a half a dozen regular snowbirders that not going to risk it. I don't blame hmm. them. Right. Uh, so things are going to be different still. If you if you look back at the 1918-1919 pandemic, Spanish flu, it's a two-year process. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean you were shut down for two years. You, you can't. You, you can't. But, but you had this two years of working it out. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, we're on track for that same thing. Uh, and we, to to what you were saying, as Americans, 
We don't sit still very well. We no, don't. Right. We don't. We're not reflective. We're not. Uh, we stay busy in order not to have to think about things. Right. I do that. You do that. Mm-hmm. That's not. A, I'm, I'm not criticizing us. I'm, I'm, I, that's some self criticism. Uh, and I'm not throwing stones at my society. I'm just saying that that we are built a certain way, and when we can't be and act that way, we don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's like uh, we mentioned at the very beginning segment in talking about freedom and and creating uh, fragments and uh, our own little tribes and echo chambers. Mm-hmm. You know, this year has just been you know it magnifies that. It, it just multiplies that to an yeah. nth degree and then mm-hmm. I, I mean you you think about you know not not going to dive into this election year not gonna do it <clears throat> election year uh you know down here particularly in other southern or, or gulf states hurricanes. all the hurricanes uh Let, the, and let's remember pandemic. let's remember that we had a <clears throat> fire here in the spring that almost burned down the beach right that was this year yeah we were we were I was driving past that as it was starting. <laughs> what? Um, you, race issues? Race issues? Uh, there, there's, but, there's so much that has been brought to the forefront that is being put on something on a platform that we've never seen before. Yeah, be, because like social media, everything is right there for what, everybody to what see. What happens when you take a sponge and you dip it in water and then squeeze it? Depends what, on what, what type of... Look what you put it in. Whatever is in it comes out. <clears throat> and what you see in this pandemic, coronavirus, and these stressors mm-hmm. that are unprecedented in our lifetimes is that it squeezes out the good, but the ugly. Whatever is on the inside, right. when pressure is applied, it comes out. Mm-hmm. And again, that requires reflection, that requires looking in the mirror. That requires it, our definitions of community, our definitions of what it means to 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 live unselfishly. Mm-hmm. All that's at play, and and we're faced. We are not indestructible. Our society is not indestructible. Mm-hmm. Our country is not indestructible. We are fragile. Mm-hmm. It, it, it was like I was saying, you know, when we were muted and a video was showing. That we've all been put out, in, or we've all been put in the timeout corner together. Yeah, and we don't know how to sit together. We don't know how to, you know. It goes back to what we were saying at the beginning. We we don't know how to have these conversations to get to know the other person's side. So when when things are posted online, you know, I had a, I overheard this recently. Um, you know, things are posted online, and I mean, people are sharing. And they continue to share, or they talk about it, and it, there's this ongoing conversation. And if you sit there long enough in the corner with other people, you begin to get aggravated because your echo chamber never thought about it this way. So you get aggravated, you get frustrated, your self-centeredness starts to go. That's not the way I thought about it. That's not the way I was brought up. Um, sure. And that that ability to listen and have conversation, and communicate, and see you as a human being is lost. And so this whole well, you know, you with civil it. rights, with particularly with civil rights, what I overheard was this person say, "I'm just tired of this conversation." And it's like you just reveal. Well, of course, you well, of just course re- you're tired of it. Sponge was squeezed. Of course you're tired of it. But <clears throat> imagine if you were a person of color over the last four hundred years. How tired are you? How tired are you? How old are you then? Right. <laughs> but my point being is that right, right, right. I'm, I'm, uh, if. <clears throat> If you don't get in someone else's shoes, exactly, uh, you can't understand. You know that's no Native American proverb, until you walk a, mi- a mile in a man's moccasins. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, you know, that's where we are, and uh, the church has its work, and I use church very broadly. The church has its work cut out for it. Mm-hmm. People it, of faith and people that are moved by the Spirit have their work cut out for them, mm-hmm. because people, people of faith and people of the Spirit get as angry as anybody else. 
Yeah. <laughs> Maybe angrier. Maybe we, angrier. We are in a fragile, it's fragile. state. It's fragile. And Everything. There's so much hanging in the balance of, you know, my personhood, who I am, who, who I bring to the table, what I've been taught, what I'm seeing, what I, how I choose to respond to what's happening around me, in my ability to just observe and watch and listen and communicate uh, still, and just hear, hear still, other people. And I, and I think when we need to be able to sit together and be together and talk <clears throat> face to face, and we can't do those things as easily because of the pandemic. Right. Hurts us in a profoundly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I and think- I, I don't think, I don't, and I appreciate the people that are watching this right now because I do think when you're live and interacting with people, it works. But I think so much of our digital communications are just feathers in the wind. Yeah. And and what is still is required are, are solid relationships. And that's, that's the component, you know, I've... I, you know, we've had this conversation multiple times. There are moments of being a pastor when you're constantly being amongst people. It's a it's a little bit of a breath of fresh air when when it's not all the time. So there, at the beginning, it was like, oh, okay, this is this is something new. This is something different. We could breathe a little bit, and you know, we could go we could go through the this process of, of doing church differently. But at the end of the day, you're missing the component of people of being amongst people and having conversations and seeing each other face to face and, um, learning about someone's move or learning about someone's family or someone's sick or, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's such a critical piece of what makes church different yeah. of what, what makes our community different. Um, uh, David's question is just fantastic there. Oh, I, I don't. I don't even know what time it is. What time is it? It's. I mean, we we could we'll, be we'll done, but we'll, we'll just keep going. Um, do we want to? Do we want to pause? Is it, we, do we want to be done with fragility? No. Let me let me finish because yeah. because something that David said is here, and then we'll, okay. then we'll then we'll move on. Made even more fragile by the malignant division and polarization that pervades every corner of our country. How do we overcome these challenges when faced by that? David, I think that is the question of the year. I think that's the question of this generation. Uh, That's part of what I'm going to process for the rest of my life about this year. Um, There's parts of this year, parts of this experience, and I'm not being dramatic, um, I just, there's parts of that, that I won't recover from. Um, not in a bad way. I'm just saying I'll be that profoundly changed. I'm being profoundly changed by it. Right. That's the better way to, to say it. Um, it's hard, but I still, St. Francis, I still want to be an instrument of peace. And I had this conversation this week with an individual I want to be an instrument of peace. I want to do my best to reach out to all people, no matter who they are. And I am equally as compelled to put my arms around the poor and the weak and the least of these and to find God in those who suffer. And I think that it behooves every Christian to try to pull off the hat trick of simultaneously being gracious while being uncompromising in the defense of the poor and the downtrodden. And when you take Jesus as an example... That's what you find. Gracious to all, welcoming to all, on the side of the poor and the hurt 
and the lost and never a word of harm or hurt or agitation toward anyone except those powerful people who were hurting mm-hmm. the very people he had taken sides with. Mm-hmm. That's hard to pull off. <clears throat> Uh, because we want to we want to gravitate to the poles because we feel that there's certainty in those places because over here on the hard right we have all the answers and over here on the hard left we have all the answers and the truth is lived out on that tension wire between those and uh, I, I've said recently that, we need bridge builders, and the thing about being a bridge builder is just, if you're a real bridge, you're going to get walked on by both sides. And um, in a real way, that's been my experience this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just now I'm just confessing. It's been my experience this year. And um, it, it can be discouraging, and uh, it can be exciting. And uh, as Bob Dylan says, the only thing I knew how to do was to keep on keeping on like a bird that flew, and that's all you know to do. I mean, this is this is this is the this is the work. Mm-hmm. We don't pick the times that we live in, right? You know, I, I was talking <clears throat> to family the other day, and you know, somebody in my family said, you know, I just hate it for Braden that you know this is his senior year, and it's just been it's just he didn't get to finish his junior year, and. Basketball season gets interrupted, and don't know for guarantees if we get to play a whole season this year. And I'm like, I feel every bit of that. But what can you do? What can you do? Yeah. I don't. I didn't. He didn't pick that time. I don't pick that time. The young men, <clears throat> the young men born in 1920 who ended up landing yeah. on that beach of ND Day, they didn't pick that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the men born in between 1945 and 1950 who ended up in Saigon, they didn't pick that time period. Right. And the other thing to think about too is, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You you don't know the impact that this will have. You know, we, we always tend to nav- you know, navigate and gravitate toward the negative aspect and but you you don't know what impact this will have on him years down the road yeah. when it's you know if we my, have- my senior year I got to spend more time with my well, mother and my dad. Did you listen? Did I listen to those 12 sermons on Joseph? I did. God intended it for good. Not, oh, that, God, not that God caused <clears throat> any of that to happen. That's not what we're saying. Mm-hmm. God working in just despicable circumstances mm-hmm. to bring about an end that no one could have imagined. Right. And so that's the hope I carry in my heart. Mm-hmm. That's the hope I carry in my heart. We got a last video, don't we? Yeah, we have a last Thanks, video. everybody. Um, so we had a segment four. I don't know if we want to get to that or not. It's just simply this Q and a uh, if, next time, next time we're, we, save we're, your questions. We're expired. Uh, we're expired. And I'll, I'll show, uh, you know, I'll pop up our, um, contact information so you can email me or Ronnie with any questions that you have that we might be able to address next week. But this video is of my kids announcing this upcoming Sunday and Nancy, you, you brought this up earlier about Operation Christmas Child. Um, So here are my boys giving a little bit of that information. So here you go, enjoy. Hi everyone! (laughs) Hi! (laughs) Will you remember that we have one condition? I'm I'm at service this Sunday at 9.30 and service online at 11.15. Also, Operation Christmas Child boxes are due November 15th. Also, please fill them out and return to the church. Live long and prosper. Bye-bye. All right, so if, if you didn't catch that, uh, this upcoming Sunday, one service, 930, and then we'll be online at 1115. Uh, those on Facebook. It, hopefully, we'll get have it posted by eleven fifteen for those watching on YouTube. Uh, if not, watch it later. 
Um, Operation Christmas Child boxes are due by November 15th. Um, contact me. I could give you Nancy Gross's information for you to get in contact with her about how best to do that. Uh, but there are boxes that are covered right now outside of the church uh, doors. So if you need a box, go there, pick it up. Uh, if you need ideas of what to pick up, I'll get you in contact with Nancy. Um, so, Nancy, please prick up a box. We got you, Nancy. <laughs> we got you covered. We want to pick it pick up. Pick up a box. Pick up a box. Thanks, everybody. We will uh, see you Sunday live, online, and then back for Q&A next week. Live long and prosper. Was a time of a preacher When a story begun Wish you left him for